Should you buy one? What's the flair like? Is it going to make your videos look amazing? In this video, we're going to go into all of our first impressions, so let's go. In every filmmaker's career, there's this magical period of time between finding out about the existence of anamorphic lenses and actually getting to use one. We fill that void by trying to fake the look with the 2.35 black bars, but trust me, mm -mm, it's not the same. Cinema lenses are expensive, right? That's where the Sure Jupiter series come in. No, darling, it's not pomegranate. What do you actually think it is? Give it another go. Oh, it's a grapefruit. Yes, there we go. They're a reasonably affordable way to access the anamorphic look. Still, $1,500 is not nothing, but by cinema standards, it's that spare change. So let's just agree that it's reasonably affordable. We created a cinematic vlog called Unseen Paris, um, which is going to be down in the description and up here. So check that out if you haven't already. But we're going to be using snippets from this as B-roll throughout this video, so you will be able to see some of the shots and the look that was achieved with this lens. Right, yeah, so what is the lens? The lens is a 75 millimeter T2.9, which is essentially like a, about an F2.8, anamorphic lens with a 1.6 times squeeze ratio. What does that mean? I hear you say. Of course, different anamorphic lenses have different squeeze ratios. The higher the ratio, the more it squeezes the image. 1.6 times, in the case of this lens, is a really nice in-between of your usual sort of squeeze ratios. 1.33 can be a bit vanilla. 2 is quite severe, so 1.6 sits just comfortably in that middle. It's an all metal design, perfectly weighted focus and aperture rings. It's everything you'd expect from a cinema lens. All right, let's move on to our impressions and what it was like to actually film with it. Yeah, 75mm is not really 75mm in the anamorphic world. So very similar to when you're converting an APS-C lens, focal lens to full frame, um, it's kind of the same thing with the squeeze factor. So a 75mm, the field of view is actually closer to 50mm. This proved to be a really, really good focal length for the sort of street cinematic vlog that we're trying to film in Paris. It was wide enough to get plenty of context and plenty of scene, but at the same time gave us enough reach to not be obtrusive and to also capture plenty of details. Composing a shot is completely different when you're using an anamorphic lens. I mean, let's back it up here. In order to even compose your shot, you need to de-squeeze it first on the fly because it just looks like mush on the back of the camera. Now, some cameras have the de-squeeze function already set up inside. Uh, unfortunately, our Sony doesn't. So our options are either using like an external display such as the Ninja 5 from Atomos, or in our case, our run and gun setup was using the Axoon Cineview Nano, which allowed us to use my iPhone as a monitor. And we were able to de-squeeze the footage and see what we're actually filming, basically what the final image is going to look like. Once you've managed to de-squeeze your footage, you will be faced with a completely different kettle of fish when it comes to composition. For some reason, with an anamorphic lens, it feels like the image is flatter. I don't know whether that's because you're losing the top and bottom, so it kind of... I don't know, It basically, it's not like using a wide-angle lens at all. I found myself being far more focused on the x-axis and the depth, like that would be, I think, the z-axis. So. I was looking for depth, I was looking for foreground, I was looking for layers to build the depth, and I was looking to get creative more in terms of the balance of the frame horizontally. Trust me, you will feel more creative, you will feel like you've had fresh inspiration when you throw this lens on your camera. The flare. Well, this is an interesting one because I was very excited about the flare. I think we're all excited about the anamorphic flare. Anamorphic lenses give you this beautiful line. <coughs> Sounds like this, like the flare's like <coughs> Very signature to the anamorphic look. But having spoken to a friend who'd shot quite a bit of anamorphic, like a firefighter, he extinguished the flames of my excitement somewhat. How poetic. Yeah, he said, you know, like the flare is, is nice and that, but it's not the main thing that'll blow you away. And he was right. Genuinely, the flare was a cool add-on, and when it appeared, I was like, ooh. Every time that you get that little tingle, ooh, nice. But it wasn't the MVP. It wasn't the star of the show. This is the most exciting thing to tell you about this lens. There is just a different quality 
a, there's a different character to the image that comes out of an anamorphic lens. It felt like the lens was literally painting the scene in front of us. The way it was rendering the colors, the way it was rendering the light, it, it really feels like there's no other way to describe it other than the dirty C word. Yes, I'm talking about cinematic. Sometimes like you use like a, a, an f1.2 lens, like an 85 f1.2 from Canon. It's almost too soft or it's so like that there's not much definition there, but this is the perfect balance of softness. The bokeh, the out of focus areas, the shape of the bokeh as well. Mm, it's just full of character. It, it's tasty, it's tasty. Anamorphic lenses are usually associated, like I mentioned, with sci-fi, futuristic flying cars, blue, techy sort of vibes. Well, we were doing the exact opposite. Warmer tones, sort of golden light, um, old town Parisian vibes were kind of very different from what you'd expect with an anamorphic lens and yet I feel like it worked so well and just gave it <clears throat> yeah stabilization was a problem we were traveling light without a tripod and without a gimbal which in hindsight was foolish we just took a, a gorilla pod which we all know is good for nothing but anyway we made a mistake you can't really use ibis or active steady shot with an anamorphic lens the squeezed image falling on the sensor makes the processor kind of go a little bit and it was doing very strange things not ideal Ultimately, we knew that we wanted to have a lot of stationary shots because we wanted it to be sort of artsy and have the scene moving rather than the camera moving. So luckily, we've got a steady hand and we used the tripod mode in Final Cut Pro to sort of really take out any of the movement and that worked for most shots. But trust me, we lost a lot of potential footage, like a lot of potential options because they were just not stable. So if you're using a cinema lens, if you're using an anamorphic lens, you've got to make sure you've got the stability, stabilization station down to a T. We're getting into the nitty gritty here, but focus breathing. I have to say, I was never bothered. People used to go on, people were like, oh, the FX3's got focus breathing compensation. What a great camera, the A7S3 hasn't got it. Oh, shit. No biggie, no biggie. But it wasn't until using this lens, which has basically zero focus breathing, like zero, that I was like, oh, wow. So it's one of those things, you know, you don't know you've got it till you, till you lose it. Or in this case, the other way around. When your lens focuses to infinity and then to its closest distance and back again, you may see that the focal length of your lens actually changes. It actually looks like your lens is zooming, going wider, going more telephoto as you focus near and far. And actually our friend Dan Chung gave us some wisdom about focus breathing and also just generally about cinema lenses and the different purpose they have. So over to Dan. I think the priorities are different. I mean, you know, we all know that the G Masters and stuff are like really sharp and everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's just greater attention paid to other things, specifically uh, what happens when you alter the focus, yeah. how okay. does that look, uh, what happens in the highlights, how does the out of focus area actually look, and when you, um, how does that no, sort of drop off. If you think about a movie, there's a specific look about Yes, like yeah. what the, the person over the shoulder looks like when they're slightly out of focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When that is sharp, what does that look like? Yeah. Or what does yeah. the light bulb over there look like? The breathing is the other one that is, you know, really big. So if you watch this, if I'm focusing from super, super close, you know, to there, and then to the background, you see how that, the basic relative, the size of that doesn't, doesn't actually change. You know, you do that on almost, not every, but almost any photo lens, it's just going to go like that. I mean, I think a lot of the things about these lenses are designed to not distract you when you're watching a movie. Yeah, it should be just in the story. You should be not just in the story, you should be just following what's going on in the drama. And so anything that sort of goes, hmm, what the hell was that? It makes you yeah, think. Yeah. The best uh, filmmaking is when you don't notice the filmmaking. Yeah. And as promised, we have to answer those burning questions. Is this lens for you? Should you buy it? Is it going to make your videos look amazing? Short answer, yes. Basically, yes, you should buy it. If you can't afford to buy it, then at least rent it for a couple of days and just see what it's about. Will it make your videos look amazing? Probably yes, yeah. I'll be honest, it's cinematic as f It will make you think outside the box. It'll make you see things differently. It's got that new camera inspiration. And if maybe if you feel like you've been in a bit of a creative rut, then this could be your way out of the hole. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel if you want to see more anamorphic goodness because there will be a lot more coming. That lens is going to be... And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.
Bye.